1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through 9. Let's go ahead and, and read them, and then we will um, dissect uh, the text within its context, but yet each verse and possibly statement. Likewise, you younger people. So those of you that are young here, like me, I'm not that young. It's speaking to you this morning. You younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him. Steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brethren in the world. The enemy would open a door of pride for you. Whereas Jesus would open a door of humility. It is up to us which door we decided to walk through. Do you walk through the door? You ever, you ever watch that uh, Wheel of Fortune or, or Jeopardy or, or those uh, The Price is Right show, you know, and they would say, okay, which door do you want? Do you want the door to the left or do you want the door to the right? You know, well, there's the door to pride or there's the door to humility. Now, we're all believers, and so we're going to say, humility, give us that door. Of course, we often find that most people will walk through the door of pride. Because it's so much easier to give in to the pride, the sinfulness of pride, the lust of pride, and so forth, than to walk through a door of humility. And so we're going to talk about humility and the adversary and how he will use the pride in our lives to destroy us. Last time we met, we looked at verses 2 through 4, where Peter was really encouraging those elders within the church, the office itself, to shepherd the flock of God which is among them. To be overseers, uh, not because of compulsion, or, uh, but willingly, or from dishonest gain, but eagerly, and not even lording it over people, but entrusting them to God. And being an example to the flock, uh, those that are leaders, to be an example, uh, not just direct and guide them in a situation, but guide them through your example in leadership. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So the encouragement of Peter towards the elders there to be faithful to God in their calling, and that when God comes back, he will be faithful to you in, in receiving a crown of glory that he's prepared for you from eternity. And some will receive great crowns because they've done great works. And others have received smaller crowns because they're in the ministry late or because they haven't done as much as the others. But we all receive the kingdom of God. Now as we draw to an end here in Peter, this week and next week, I really have to say that I've been really appreciating his, his little epistle here so much. I, I've grown so much to understand the man, Peter, you know. Uh, this man who had experienced so much walking with Jesus Christ. If you can only imagine walking with Jesus, what you would have learned walking with Jesus. It would be for us today, it would be like us walking with a, with a great man of God, like Chuck Smith. What would that have been like to walk with Chuck on a daily basis? What would it have been like to walk with Jesus every day? And Peter walked with him every day. And Peter got to know him, and Jesus obviously knew him and his failures, his anxieties, his worries, his cares, his pride, his humility, and, you know, and so forth, his commitment, all those things. And so Peter pours his heart out here to the church that is suffering uh, about all the things that he had learned uh, with Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ. Uh, the religious leaders, when they saw Peter and John they realized they were uneducated men, but one thing that they did realize, that they had been with Jesus. And so the fact that others can realize that you've been with Jesus says a lot about your walk with the Lord. You know, it says a lot about your light shining and being salt, that you are literally living what you believe, what you profess. It's not just words, but you're living it, that people will look at you and say, you're different. Have you been with Jesus? Are you a Christian? 
You know, why do you care so much? Why do you love so much? Why doesn't it rub you the wrong way? Why are you a person of humility? It must be because you've been with Jesus. And so I, I've just really grown to love Peter even more. I think he's probably one of the, the greatest apostles of the New Testament. And you might be saying, well, what about Paul? Yeah, Paul was too, but I relate more to Peter. You know, because Peter made a lot of mistakes, put his foot in his mouth so many times, you know, said things before he should have said them and should have thought about them before he said them. And, and I'm kind of like that with Peter, too. And yet God loved Peter so much that he gave him a ministry. And Peter is just pouring his heart here. So Peter calls us to humility because he understands that humility he had to be humbled when he denied the Lord and then the Lord come back to Peter and say, hey, come and feed my sheep. Come take care of my sheep. That's humility. You have to be humbled at that situation, knowing that you had failed, that God really had a right to say, forget it, I'm not using you anymore. But yet, here's Jesus standing before him saying, can you feed my sheep? Lord, why would you even ask me? I mean, I don't deserve this. I mean, that's true humility. So he understands being humble and not being prideful. And so he encourages the younger, he says here in verse 5, likewise you younger people. Now, not necessarily pointing out an individual, but he's speaking to a group of youth, young people, those that are coming up within the church, those that are growing to know Jesus Christ, those children that the parents have poured into about the ways of the Lord and their hearts are to know God and to know more of God and really to be used of God. That's who he's speaking to, these young youth that are struggling with submission of elders because you know youth. Youth are, are strong, they're vibrant, they get passionate. And that's why we really need to reach out to the youth. But one thing about youth is sometimes they overstep their boundaries and they, they begin to not submit but to take authority when they shouldn't be taking authority yet because they're not that, at that age. They're not understanding that responsibility. And as Paul said, they're more going on zeal than on knowledge, you know, as he said in Scripture and so forth. So here, Peter asks the youth to submit yourselves to your elders and the word elders there is the office within the church itself the word submit again is a military term and it basically just means to come under that office and submit to it so what is peter saying you are to willfully place yourself under an older person it doesn't mean that you're less than that person it doesn't mean that you don't have any more wisdom than that person all it means is that person has an office that is above your office. And that that person is being led by God. And as God is leading that person, you are to submit under that person because you are his responsibility. One responsibility of a parent is to train up their children to respect their elders, isn't it? And we do that all the time. We have little kids and we're directing them, respect your elders. Don't talk back. Don't hit people. You know, those things, you're training them to respect your elders. And yet when we grow up, do we respect our elders as adults? It's hard because we don't like to submit. We don't like to come under someone, and not necessarily within the church itself, but anywhere, because we choose the door of pride instead of the door of humiliation. J. Vernon McGee said this, this has been revised in our days, that is, that youth are to submit unto uh, the elders, so this has been revised in our days. Today the elders is supposed to submit to the younger. Younger people are the ones who are protesting. They're the ones who want to discard the establishment. Uh, however, the Christian young person needs to realize that the word of God says, ye younger, submit yourselves to elders. After all, your father, if you have a good father, a godly father, has a lot of sense and maybe more sense than you know. And so submission to your elders within the church is something that God has always professed as truth. It's a good principle to have an understanding. keeps you out of trouble. Unfortunately, we have parents that aren't training their children into that. Just this last weekend, we had a major accident on a Limonite. Kids that were speeding, one girl died because they weren't submitted to the law. And so they were speeding, went head on, and that's it. Young youth, gone, just like that. 
God says in Leviticus, you shall rise before the gray-headed and honor the presence of an old man. And then he says, and fear your God. I am the Lord. Out of fear of God. If anything, because God is my God, and as a youth I am to respect my elders. Why? Why should we? Hebrews tells us, obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls. They care about you. As those who must give an account, let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. As a parent, as a pastor, um, and you as a parent and as a leader, you love your kids, don't you? You love your kids. There's going to come a time when your kids are going to think you don't love them because you're disciplining them, you're correcting them, or you're trying to keep them from something. And they're going to say, you don't love me. In fact, they're going to feel it in their heart that you don't love them. There's going to come a time even when you're, they're adults and you're older that your kids are going to come against you and they're going to accuse you of things. That's just life. And you're going to feel, they don't love me. They don't respect me. Here, I'm an older man, and I pour my heart out into my children. I love them to death, and I would never do anything to harm them but to look out for them. And yet their perspective is, you're trying to hurt me. You don't care. You don't love me enough. You know? And that's a difficult place to be. A parent's heart is to love their kids. Do they make all the right decisions? Of course not. No. No, we're not perfect. But they love their kids. They love their kids. Just as a pastor loves the church. He's supposed to love the church. He's supposed to care about the church. He's supposed to watch out for their souls. He's supposed to care about their eternal salvation, about their walk in this world so that they don't trip, they don't fall, they don't fall in the wrong hands so that someone doesn't take them. Because there's a lot of opposition out there against the church. And a pastor is to have a heart for the church. And yet, the pastor will be accused of a lot of things. Someone said submission focuses not on personality, but on position, on position. It's not the person, it's the position. It's the place that they hold. That is what we submit ourselves to. We need to see authority not over us as acting on their own, but as instruments of God's hands. We really do, even within the church and within the families. That father, that mother is acting as though God were acting. You know, they're, they're looking out for your best interests. Let's really understand this. If we're to look at people as acting on their own, then we become bitter at them. Because we think they're making that decision. We think they're against us. We think that they're trying to hurt us. And they're just acting for their own benefit. But if we think that they're acting on God's instinct, and allowing God to lead and guide them, that gives us a different perspective. That maybe God is using them to lead me and guide me. It's a beautiful example found in the life of Joseph. Boy, his brothers hated him, but yet he was humbled by his brothers. And he took that place of humility, even all the way to prison. And at the end he said, what, what they intended for evil, God turned around for good. Because he realized God's hand was within it. Even within the evil of what men are doing. And we fight against it, but maybe God's allowing it for some reason. A seed who's in an Iranian prison right now has been beat up and then hospitalized, and now he's back in. There's a reason for that. Yes, pray for him. Yes, hope that God would help him get out of the situation, but there's a reason for that. It speaks highly of God's grace. It speaks of his love for Christ, his stance on, on God. You know, there's a great reason and a great work that God is doing through that. Yes, the Iranians are wrong. Yes, what they're doing to him is wrong. But what an example of humiliation. Submission is an act of faith. We are trusting God to direct our lives and to work out his purposes in our lives. And so by faith, we submit ourselves, knowing that God has a purpose for leading and guiding us in that way. He continues and says, yes, all of you be submissive one to another. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, every time you find this, you always find this order. Paul does it too. You know, he says, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. We hate that verse. But then immediately afterwards, it says, submitting one to another. And the wife says, aha, see, it doesn't mean I have to submit to you. We have to submit to one another. And Peter does the same thing here. Younger people submit you know, to your elders. And then he says, but all of you submit to one another. Aha, see? 
See, because you get the wrong perspective. You think that, that, that an individual who's saying this is just trying to get to the younger or get to the wife, but that's not what God's doing. What he's trying to say is that we submit one to another of the word of God, of the word of God. And what does the word of God say? And then applying it, and guess what? The word of God says younger submit to your elders. Wives submit to your husbands. Submit to one another because husbands will love their wives, cherish their wives. You know, and all the things the scriptures have shared. And yes, we are to submit to one another. If you come up to me and you find an error flaw and it's true, then I will have to change that, you know. I will have to apologize for that because I have to submit to the word of God and the truth of it. And so for just as you would have to do the same. So why? The answer is to submit to the written word. And everyone is responsible to God for this. Paul says, submitting to one another in fear of God. We really need that fear of God. Now, how do we do this? Well, he says in the next statement, be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Be clothed on with humility. Literally, put it on. It speaks of someone taking an apron, wrapping it around it, and tying it. Let's put on humility. Let's make the choice to be humble. The word humility... Is saying taking the lesser position, even though you may have the authority, but taking the lesser position. One translation said, put on the apron of humility, for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Just as Jesus took on the garment and began to wash the feet of the disciples. That's humility, isn't it? It truly is. We were at the conference yesterday, and um, Ken Gra- Graves, he... Uh, he started off with his message, and I was kind of like, oh, a repeat of last year, because he gave the same um, analogies. But then he got into uh, his relationship with two men, uh, one man that tried to take advantage of him and another man that was a spiritual leader. <clears throat> and the thing that got me, because I'm studying this, was the humility of this man, because this man that he described that was a spiritual leader to him, and a father, because he didn't have a father figure, uh, he said this man was big and strong. He was just a strong man. You know, he was uh, in the reserves or something like that, military of some sort. Just a strong man. And he watched him deteriorate to nothing because he got sick. And he said he was with him the other day. He's laying in bed and can't even move. And the man says to Ken, he says, can I ask you to do something for me? You know, now, if you know Ken Gears, he's, he's a, from Maine. He's a man. I mean, he's huge. And his voice is like... What do you want me to do? You know, that type of just screaming voice. You know, yes, I'll do it for you. You know, and the guy says, could you pick me up and take me to the restroom? Because I can't do the bedpan anymore. And I'm just like, whoa. To ask somebody to do that for you, you know, that's humility. Because when you're strong and you're big and you're used to doing that and taking care of things and now you're asking someone else that's a man that's big and strong to lift you up. And he said, I lifted him up and I put him on the toilet there. His head was rested on my chest. That's humility right there. That's the position that God wants us to have with one another. Position of humility. Not pushing our ways and our ideas and our thoughts but being humble. Humility is not demeaning ourselves and thinking poorly ourselves. No, it's simply not thinking about ourselves at all. You know, say, I just need that help. David Guzik said, it is the ability to cheerfully put away your own agenda for God's, even if God's agenda is expressed through another person. If you were a slave, you would take this white scarf, you would tie it on you, fasten it like a belt, and then people would know around you that you were a slave. And that's humility. Because they would see you. If you had this scarf around you at that time, in Peter's time, and it was wrapped around, they know that's a slave right there. And you'd walk around that way in humility, knowing that people would not respect you, not honor you, because you're not esteemed very highly. You're just a slave. And yet they wore it as a badge of humility. The Greeks never had a word for humility because they felt that the word was weak. That if you were a humble person, you were a weak person. And so they didn't want to create a word for it. And yet in Christianity, it is a strong person that is a person of humility. 
as our Savior Jesus Christ was. There was a memorial service for George Whitfield, who was a great evangelist. He had passed away. And him and John Wesley did not always agree on each point. And so as John Wesley was at the funeral, someone came up to him and asked John Wesley, do you think you'll see George Whitfield in heaven? And John Wesley said, I don't think so. And he said, oh, really? He says, yeah. I think that George Whitfield will be too close to the throne and I'll be too far behind that I won't see him in heaven. That's humility. I won't even be as close as John Whitfield. That's true humility. It's the opposite of pride, isn't it? Peter continues, says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so you want to be blessed by God? Then be a person of humility. Be a person that's humbled. And God will bless you. In fact, he tells us that he'll lift you up. James says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up when we humble ourselves before the Lord. An argument starts, just say, okay, all right. And you just leave it at that. You draw the line like Moses. There's a line, Korah. We'll let God decide what the situation is. Humility. Therefore, humble yourselves, verse 6, under the mighty hand of God. And really, that, that is the power of the humility, is that it's in the mighty hand of God himself who created the heavens and the earth. John the Baptist said, I must decrease and he must increase. So I must be humble in all humility so that Christ's work can continue on. I need to get out of the way so that Christ will do what he wants to do. That's humility. A lot of us need to get out of the way and let Christ do what he wants to do. And sometimes Christ Christ wants to use you, but you're not humble enough to be used of God. And so you make excuses, I can't do it. I don't have the ability. You know, he can't use me. Or maybe it's the opposite. You know, I don't want to. See, that's pride. When God's saying, I want to use you, and you're not doing it. That's not humility, that's pride. Malachi says, He has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your God. The hand of God. It's an Old Testament picture. God's presence, God's power, and God's purpose. It is God who raises you up. It is God who lifts you up when we are humble. And so it's His destiny. Now his next statement says that he may exalt you in due time. And so he says, casting all your cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. I love that scripture. I, I memorize that scripture because there are times where I get anxious. The word care, the second care or the first care there is anxious. It, it means to divide or to draw a different direction. It means to worry. In other words, you get anxious over things. And he's saying here, cast those anxieties on the Lord, upon him, on his shoulders, because he cares for you. No one else cares for you as much as he cares for you. And he's saying, take all of your anxieties, all of your cares and your worries and put them on him and leave them there. Don't take them back because he knows what to do with them. He'll take care of you. And if he's God with a mighty hand, with all power, then he can take care of you. And in your humility. Now Peter's quoting from the Psalms. It's nothing different. Even the Jews understood that you were to cast your burdens on the Lord and he will sustain you, Psalms 55, 22. In fact, he says, he shall never permit the righteous to be moved if you cast your cares upon him. He wants you to cast your cares Upon him. He's waiting for you to cast your cares. It's like a strong man who's walking along a road and there's this old person and he's got this load. You've seen the picture with old people and they got sacks on them and they're carrying this, you know, like this. And this strong man's walking along and he's like, Can I help you? Oh, I got it. I got it. And the man's like, oh, I don't have anything. Can you know I can take some of No, I got it. I leave me alone, you know? I can handle it. Well, but if you just give me some of it, you could really get to where you need to go a lot faster. No, oh, I got it. I'll get there in my own time. Just leave me alone, you know? And the guy's like, man, I help you out here. That's how Jesus is. You got this load. Why do you 
try to carry it yourself. I care so much about you. I want to carry that load. Will you give me some of that load? No, Lord, I got it. I don't need you. Really? You don't need me? You don't need me? Man, that hurts. You don't need me. We understand that feeling as parents, right? Because we love it when our kids need us. Because we want that relationship. I have a purpose here. I have a reason for living to help you. You know, and God wants our cares to be cast upon Him because He wants that dependency. And he wants to lighten your load. He wants to help you. George Mueller, who is a great uh, man of God, he loved children. He, he loved to take care of orphans. And a lot of his... Um, Stories are stories of faith. He was a man that never asked for money. Not like we do. Not like a lot of other churches. He just totally trusted in God. There was one story where, where they didn't have milk. And so he just got all the kids together in this building where he took care of these kids and just said, let's pray. God, we need milk. We need milk. You, you know we need milk. He wouldn't ask anybody for anything. And all of a sudden a milk truck breaks down in front of his orphanage. The guy says, it's all going to spoil. Would you guys like milk? Yeah, we'll take it. So then they say, we need meat. Lord, we need meat. A meat truck comes by and it breaks down right in front of their, their church. You know, these are the type of things that happen because they're totally dependent on Christ, not on man. He said this, the beginning of anxiety is the end of faith. The beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety. That's powerful, isn't it? If you're anxious, it's because you're lacking the faith to truly trust in Christ. And if you truly had faith, there would be no anxiety. Is God really in control of your life? Does he really have you right where you want to be? Not where you want to be, but it's right where he wants you to be. See, we don't like that because we're not in a good place. Why would God want me here? Because he's teaching you something. Why are you anxious? Is God not in control? Well, yeah, I believe He's in control. No, you don't, because you're anxious. No, you don't. It's really coming to the understanding that He's in total control, and I'm standing here because He knew I'd stand here, even if it was millions of years ago, in all eternity when God existed, He knew I'd stand right here saying what I'm saying right now. He knew that. He knew that I would fail, that I would fall, that I would come short. He knows all those things. And so we confess it and we move on. He knew we'd do that. And so why do we get anxious? Because of lack of faith. Someone has written that the average person's anxieties are focused on 40% on things that will never happen. 40%. Think about that. I started thinking about that. Most of the time when I'm thinking about things that will happen, they never happen. 40% of them don't happen. 30% of those things are about the past, by the way. You can't change the past. And yet we think of the past. Oh, that guy did this. You know, did that, and that's, that's why I don't do this no more. You can't change that. Look to the future. 12% of those things are criticisms by others that are un- even untrue. They probably aren't even said. And they probably don't even matter. Who cares? And yet we worry about that. Only 8% are real problems. Only 8% of your problems are real. The rest, throw them aside. Leave them alone. It is amazing. I understand that feeling because I laid in bed with this injury and I'm thinking, that's it, Lord, I'm dying. Really? You're dying from a hip injury? That's what I thought in my head. I'm dying. I literally called all my boys together for, to say goodbye and tell them where everything was because I thought I was dying. And they all came in and they prayed for me. I literally thought I was dying. So I wanted to make sure they knew where all the, all the secret money was that hidden. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, and the combinations and, you know, and, and the secret accounts that my wife didn't know about. No, I'm just kidding. Because you know? I thought I was dying, and yet from a hip injury. <laughs> I broke my nail. Oh, that's it. I'm losing my job. No one's ever going to be able to go. I was like, what? <laughs> we get anxious over things that, that really aren't there or true or... We should stop worrying about them. Cast those cares on Him. If we don't, if we don't humble 